Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital uh, in Paris, in France. And it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, uh, new broadcast uh, of the Journal Club by the International Academy for uh, Clinical Hematology. It is actually 8 p.m. in Paris, 7 p.m. in London, 2 p.m. in Baltimore, where uh, our uh, guest uh, uh, panelist uh, uh, is based. And today, uh, of course, as usual, I would like to acknowledge all our supporters and the steering committee of the ICH has selected this recently published paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title is Post Transplant cyclophosphamide based graft versus host disease prophylaxis by Dr. Uh, Javier Polanos Mead and his colleagues uh, uh, for the BMT CTN 1703 investigators. And actually, uh, it's really an amazing story, this uh, post size story, because some of you may remember the 2002. Uh, paper and then the subsequent paper in 2008 by Leo Lusnik, which was published uh, in BBMT. And since this, uh, I would say, seminal uh, publication, uh, the use of POSI uh, for GVHD prophylaxis uh, did uh, a very, very long journey. And beside now, the haplo transplant setting, it's becoming more and more a popular uh, regimen uh, in the match unrelated, mismatch unrelated, but also in the match related setting. And we will discuss all this. So here you can see the uh, summary of this trial as it has been published uh, in the New England of Medicine. It is a straightforward phase three randomized multi-center trial where patient received uh, in the experimental arm, the GVHD prophylaxis uh, using uh, post cyclophosphamide plus tacrolimus and MMF, mofetil, And in the control arm, they received the standard of care or the so-called standard of care prophylaxis, namely tacrolimus and metotrexate. And the patient uh, who were included are uh, received an allotransplant from an HLA match related donor or a matched unrelated donor, but also a seven out of eight mismatched unrelated donor, but also they have used a reduced intensity conditioning. And you will see why, because the median age was, I think, around 66 or 65, which obviously highlight that we're talking about an older population, and that's quite different from what uh, we historically have seen in the field of transplant. And the primary endpoint is shown here. This is about the adjusted GVHD-free and relapse-free survival. And as you can see, it is definitely a, a big a win or a big success for the experimental arm uh, compared to the uh, standard uh, prophylaxis. And you can appreciate the highly significant difference uh, when it comes uh, to uh, these two regimens. And we owe this to a significantly lower incidence of severe grade three to four acute GVHD, but also a lower uh, incidence of uh, a chronic, uh, namely severe chronic uh, GVHD. When it comes to the uh, disease-free survival and overall survival, there were no statistically, I would say, uh, significant differences, but you can see that the orange curves are above the uh, blue curves, which is uh, already uh, very uh, good news. So with this, I'll stop my introduction and I'd like to welcome our two panelists, uh, namely Professor Javier Bolanos-Mead, 
who is professor at the John Hopkins in the United States. He is the first author of uh, uh, this paper. Uh, thank you, Javier, for joining us. I know it's a very busy clinic day for you, and uh, we'll hear maybe uh, your beep uh, uh, ringing at some point, so no worry about this. And the expert who will uh, discuss uh, also today is Professor Florent Malar uh, from uh, the Sorbonne University here uh, in Paris. So thank you, Florent, and thank you, Javier, and welcome to all of you. And of course, as usual, Thank you. The Journal Club is uh, being broadcasted live. Uh, and uh, of course, you can interact uh, with the panelists, and I'll do my best to share the questions and the comments. So, as it is always the tradition, my first question goes to the non co author. So, this is going to be for you, Florent. And it's about your general feeling impression when you saw this paper. Uh, usually for us in Europe, this is you, and on Thursday morning when we see uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, articles being released and you jumped on it. This is your field of expertise and you read it, you read the abstract and what was your global feeling? So, so yes, it was really a great news to have this paper finally published online and to see that it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, because we are speaking about a paper about bone marrow transplantation, about gravacious disease prophylaxis, and uh, for a lot of pharmaceutical companies and everything, this is not a very exciting field. And we know that still today we are able, there is some very high level team that are able to produce this kind of prospective phase three randomized study that established a new standard of care for gravitational so disease prophylaxis and that validate in these randomized phase three studies the use of fast transplant cyclophosphamide combined with this platform of an calcinorin inhibitors plus mycophenate mofetil. We'll discuss later maybe the, the use of the kind of calcinorin inhibitors we can use, but that established that this is a new platform with the addition of fast transplant cyclophosphamide for this platform that has been established now for 20 or 30 years. So this is a, a, a really a, a big achievement. And I really would like to congratulate you, uh, Javier, for all the great work you perform with your scrotter to be able to perform these randomized first three studies and to be able to publish these very amazing results. Thank you, Florence. So apparently, you are very enthusiastic and very happy with these results. And actually, all of us in the field were very happy. So Javier. You're going to explain to us and to our audience, and this is really very popular uh, today, uh, although we are in the middle of the summer, at least for us in Europe, so many people are on vacation. This is really amazing, the number of people attending. So what was the rationale uh, behind developing such randomized phase three trial? Because post-sci is now well established and everybody's using it. So please give us a little bit about what was behind the scene? Uh, sure. No, thank you. Thank you very much for for the invitation. By the way, I I have to say uh, this has been an, actually a very interesting uh, ride. First of all, I think that you're the first time uh, uh, that anybody comes to mention the 2002 paper. I, I sometimes I believe that that paper went unnoticed. Uh, I know. Perhaps I read because it. it was a relatively no, sure. <laughs> now I know, but it, because it was a rather small study, I'm not so sure that it caused the stir that um, that should have. But we have been working with cyclophosphamide for almost 25 years here at Hopkins, right? From from the time when Efren Fuchs and Leo Losnick and Paul O'Donnell started working with animals, all the way to when we start doing it in in the haploidentical setting. And at some point in time, it was exceedingly clear. That uh, that this was an effective approach for graft versus host disease prophylaxis, as as we eventually published in two thousand and eight. Now, <clears throat> with the, the the first uh, interest that uh, that we had was on on people who had uh, mismatches, so the haploidentical setting. And when Leo Losnick published it, and I'm sure that by now almost everybody has heard the story that that paper was rejected from every single journal that you can imagine. It, it was submitted to so many journals before uh, BBMT, 
that I just lost count. But when it was published, it, it was very quickly recognized as an effective approach for mismatch transplantation. And I think that the technology, the platform was adopted relatively quickly. However, when that paper uh, came to, to be published, we were already using it uh, for patients receiving match transplants, but with bone marrow grafts, because here we are very bone marrow uh, institution as, as opposed to peripheral blood. And we were seeing that the results were actually very good. So we took it uh, to the BMT CTN and said, you know, we have this approach that is working. And, and the BMT CTN, uh, after many discussions, decided, okay, let's just uh, launch uh, a randomized phase two study in which we can um, study different uh, prophylactic approaches for graft versus host disease, and then see if any of these is, uh, will eventually merit comparison uh, against uh, tacrolimus and methotrexate. So um, uh, at that point in time, that's what eventually became BMT-CTN-1203, which is the randomized phase two study. And essentially that study had the, the post-transplant site platform compared with a, a bortezomib tacrolimus methotrexate platform versus a tacrolimus methotrexate maraviroc pla platform that if you remember was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. Um, and um, I was uh, in charge uh, of that study uh, with uh, John Corrith from Boston and essentially, uh, and Rand Reshef, I'm sorry. So because Bortezomib was coming from Boston, uh, Marabirog was uh, from uh, University of Pennsylvania. So Rand Reshef is the one who published it in the New England Journal and myself representing the cyclophosphamide. So the three of us were the study chairs. And um, we, uh, we ran the study and that study has, uh, uh, at that time, something that was actually very, very new right now, we take uh, as, a, as, a, as a standard thing, which was we came up with uh, this uh, uh, combined uh, endpoint, which was the patients needed to be, to be a success, free of severe acute graft versus host disease, free of severe chronic graft versus host disease, and they need to be alive and in remission, which is something that was relatively new when we come up with this study. So this randomized phase two was essentially all the arms were not compared against each other, but they were compared against a contemporary control patients from the CIV MTR getting TAC methotrexate. Um, and the study actually accrued very well. And at the end of the day, it showed that the platform cycle, the cyclophosphamide platform was far superior because in the other in the other arms, there was no difference with TAC methotrexate in any of the outcomes. Uh, and and tacrolimus methotrexate was um, suggestive to be superior. When when I presented those results to the BMT CTN, and then eventually in Utah in ASBMT in 2018, I think it was, uh, I thought that the the transplant community would say, okay, well this is enough to really decide that cyclophosphamide is useful. Let's just move on. Oh, I was I wrong. Um, when I presented this data, uh, everybody said, oh, this is very interesting. This is very good. Now we need a phase three study. Okay, so, wonderful. So then, uh, yes, that's how, I, that's how 1703 came to be. Excellent. Well, this is a very logical and actually we're fortunate in the field having uh, such a strong network like the BMT-CTN to run these trials, which are in general of little interest to uh, because they don't have like these fancy new drugs. So here, my question to both of you, and I'll start with Florent. Uh, obviously, on one hand, the study achieved its primary endpoint, and this is really good news. But then there are some weaknesses, in my humble uh, opinion, and uh, I'd like to ask both of you to have a sort of a despite the enthusiasm and despite the practice changing nature of the study, what are the major strengths and uh, some of the weaknesses that you have noticed, Florent? So, yeah, thank you, Mohamed, for this question. One of, of the key questions, this is the question of the use of ATG, of anti-thymocyte globulin, because 
of course, this is not standard of care to use ATG uh, in the US, and this is well discussed in the article, in the discussion that is that is reported that use of ATG is associated with an increased relapse rate. Nevertheless, we have several randomized phase three studies that establish in a similar population risk regimens patients uh, with uh, a 10 out of 10 or 6 out of 6 uh, match rated on unrest donors that establish that the use of ATG uh, to this platform of calcineurin inhibitors on microphenate mofetil uh, improve patients' outcomes. So we can question that, in fact, into the control harm, it will be good to compare to ATG, but with some adapted dose of ATG, of course, not the higher dose that is associated with a relapse, an increased risk of relapse. So in my opinion, it, it is the, the, the main, this is not a weakness, of course, but this is the main question we should discuss regarding uh, the article that we, we, we can say that this is the new standard uh, treatment classics, but we cannot establish that this improved patient's outcome compared to the platform with the use of ATG as we are routinely using this platform in Europe in such patients. So what, what is your uh, reply to this uh, uh, key difference sure, between I the European see... and North American practice? Sure, I, I certainly see the, the controversial issue. In, in the US, if I were to propose a study including ATG, it will be an exceedingly hard sell because the CIBMTR data and uh, data that we have from the Dana-Farber suggest that, uh, that ATG can create the problems that were described, shorter uh, survival, increased rate of relapse. Uh, now, in, in the U.S. too, uh, there are some um, uh, some controversies about ATG because whether you're going to use uh, rabbit, whether you're going to use horse, and whether no two different vials of ATG are actually the same here in the U.S. is 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 always been a matter of discussion. However, um, I'm going to tell you we have actually published on the use of site uh, 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 an ATG. Um, we published uh, in, I want to believe it was 2019, a paper on patients with hemoglobin disorder, sickle cell thalassemia, using post-transplant psi with ATG. And the results from the, from the GBHD perspective, perspective are phenomenal. It, it is almost, uh, it, 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 nobody gets GBHD in, in the, these circumstances. The problem is, uh, or the, 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 the fact is in that particular study, nobody had cancer. And here, everybody will be very, very concerned about increasing the immunosuppression and increasing the risk of relapse of the primary tumor, which is not an issue in sickle cell. Now, one of the beauties about the study that uh, of this particular study that we just published, um, that is the subject of this review, is the fact that despite the intensive uh, immunosuppression with the cyclophosphamide, we didn't see the increase in relapse. Or the, or the decrease in survival that one would expect that when the uh, immunosuppression is more intense, you could see. And we didn't see that. Uh, and here people are afraid of, uh, of adding the ATG because then they're expecting to see just an increase in relapse on either platform, either TAC methotrexate or cyclophosphamide. Uh, so I <clears throat> acknowledge that. I don't think it's the only weakness of our study. Um, I, I uh, can come up with at least another one, which is the fact that we didn't include children. And the, the reason for that is at least in the US, children are not commonly offered uh, reduced intensity transplants. Uh, uh, so we thought that if we were to uh, include children, we would not be very representative of, of, uh, of uh, the population in general of patients getting uh, transplants. But I, I absolutely recognize the, the controversy about ATG. Those are the reasons why we didn't do it. And I'll just add that I wish we could have uh, included children on the study, but that was just during the development of the protocol, it was very clear that it was not going to be feasible. No, definitely your reasoning is clear. There is also another key issue of uh, differences in practice between North America and Europe is about the use of the calcineurin inhibitor. Uh, 
clearly, and this is mentioned in the discussion of your paper, Javier, uh, uh, in the US, you use tacrolimus up to 90% of the patient. On the other hand, in Europe, it's mainly about cyclosporine. Uh, is this but I don't, it, key issue? I, I don't think that matters. It doesn't matter. What do you think? For no. I, so if you let me just one minute elaborate on please, this and please. why I don't think it doesn't matter. I think everybody in the audience is familiar with the studies that were run a few years ago comparing TAC uh, methotrexate versus TAC cycl cyclosporine in both the related and unrelated uh, settings. And the differences uh, were very controversial in the time because one of the studies show it, it, that there were many small differences, but the, the, the groups were not well balanced. I think that in the, as a matter of practice, at least in the US, people agree that both are the same as far as results. The reason why tacrolimus is more uh, popular in the US is uh, patient preference. Patients don't like to take the big pills. That, that's the way in which cyclosporine is available in the US. And patients abhor the terrible taste that comes with cyclosporine. Uh, and we don't have those problems with tacrolimus. So it is entirely a matter of, of just convenience, it, uh, not because one we think is better than the other one. I, I never met the physician in the US or in any part of the world that will come and tell me, oh, absolutely tacro is better or absolutely cyclosporine is better. I don't think anybody here thinks that. Excellent. Fair enough. And I fully agree with you. So now we have a question uh, uh, and maybe you can handle this, Florent. This is about uh, uh, the issue, which is actually wasn't like, uh, I don't believe the study was powered for this, but this is about being immunosuppression free at some point. Uh, how valuable is this and how important is this uh, for the patient in general? And uh, could this be a sort of a, an important indicator for the success of any prophylaxis uh, regimen in GBHD? Yes, because of course the, the goal is uh, is to achieve uh, the, the the to be able to stop immunosuppression in our patients uh, because uh, if you have immunosuppressive treatment for a very long time you will increase the risk of relapse and as uh, Javier said the aim is if we add more immunosuppression is not also to increase the relapse relapse risk in our patients so this is important to have a quick uh, immunosuppression withdrawal in or patients. And also, if we have some patient immunosuppressive free, that indicate that those patients did not develop acute or chronic gram disease. And this is also very important because the aim is not only to cure patients of the uh, leukemia or so on, but is also to be cured and uh, to be uh, in a good health and to, to not uh, to have a lot of comorbidity with chronic gram disease and so on. So to be free of immunosuppression is a very important endpoint to achieve. Excellent. So one question uh, for you, uh, Javier, is about the impact of the source of stem cells, whether it is bone marrow or peripheral, peripheral blood stem cells. Do you see uh, a key difference when uh, choosing between these two sources when it comes to the intensity of the immunosuppressive uh, regimen or the combination, would you modulate whether if you use bone marrow versus PBSCs? This is among the many questions we received. For instance, Dr. Madney is asking about this. Well, so a couple of things that I can tell you. Number one, this platform works very well on blood or marrow. And in fact, while the data is also minimal in this regard, I also have seen reports on, on cord blood uh, with um, very encouraging uh, outcomes. So this is going to work either way. However, many a uh, couple of years ago, I heard uh, Dan Weiser from the University of, of Minnesota saying one thing that I thought is key. If you want to get rid of chronic GBH, what you need to do is to use marrow. Forget about drugs. Marrow is the most important determinant in whether somebody will, marrow versus blood, use, the use of marrow is the most important determinant in whether somebody will get bad chronic GBH. So when the data that we have, and it's been published, uh, granted single center, but the data that we have using marrow and cyclophosphamide is extraordinary from the GBHD perspective. And in fact, when we did 1203, 
that was the very first time that we at Hopkins were going to be using cyclophosphamide with blood because as of that time, we have only done it with marrow. And in fact, when we moved forward with the first study in the CTN, I was a little bit anxious because we were going to be doing uh, testing the platform in blood when we've never done it uh, uh, in Baltimore. But uh, this works in either way. In both uh, scenarios, you're going to see uh, very, very good uh, control of GBHD. But when you do this with marrow, the results are fantastic. I mean, I mean if they're good in, in blood, in marrow, the results are very, very, very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, another question we have from the audience, because in the experimental arm with POSI, it was MMF, and in the control arm, it was metotrexate. Can we extrapolate uh, uh, these results if uh, MMF was used instead of uh, metotrexate in the other arm? Because, for instance, again, in Europe, Cyclosporin MMF is really the standard prophylaxis regimen uh, in the reduced intensity conditioning setting. What do you think? I mean, what's your experience, both of you? Well, I don't know if Florent wants to go first. Yeah, so, so, so I, I think we have some several retrospective and prospective study that that's, that's compares the use of calcineurin inhibitor with microfinat morphetil or metotrexate with more or less some comparative results, in particular in the RIC setting. So I think this is pretty the same. Some people will say that if you use metotrexate, you are maybe more, more effective. So in this case, we can say that we have the strongest control arm because they use metotrexate. If you use MMF alone, people would have say, yeah, but of course it was 100% certain that will improve the outcome with the addition of, of, of PTSI. So I, I think we'll have exactly the same results if they use uh, MMF into the, the control arms. Fair enough, Javier. Yeah, I... I um... I have personally never used MMF and cyclosporine, for instance, but we mentioned uh, the Dodge study that did, um, that um, was presented in NASH and, uh, a couple of years ago in a plenary session and eventually was published. And the studies, uh, that particular study, the OVON 96, is not the same study as ours. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of differences, uh, so I don't necessarily want to to say that they're uh, uh, the same. But uh, even in that study, the use of cyclo, cyclo, uh, cyclophosphamide proved better than cyclosporin and mycophenolic acid, not mycophenolate mofetil. Now, in the U.S., nobody uses mycophenolic acid as uh, as uh, in bone marrow transplantation, or if anybody does, it's very few people. But I can see the the analogy and results between MMF and mycophenolic acid anyway, just based on on the metabolism of the drugs. Um, but the Dutch did the, the experiment, and in their experiment, um, uh, it shows that the cyclo, uh, cyclophosphamide arm was perhaps superior to the uh, cyclosporine and mycophenolic mycophenolic ar uh, acid arm. Excellent. So let's move now to the. Uh, toxicities, because we have a lot of questions about toxicities. And maybe I'll direct this to uh, you, Javier. We have a question whether, beside GVHD, whether you have seen a decreased incidence of damage to other organs and other complications. I know this may not have been uh, a clear endpoint uh, in the trial, but what is your impression? Well, so for sure. Um... The, the supplemental uh, uh, manuscript of the, of the paper has, I think, 30 pages that, 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 that are devoted to these, to, to other problems, other side effects, and comparison infection complications, and uh, specifics about toxicities and so on. I would say that in general, and I'm summarizing a lot of data in the next two sentences, in general, the, 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 the regimens are as well or as poorly tolerated. And I wouldn't say necessarily that one was substantially better than the other in terms of side effects. What we saw is that there is maybe a little bit more infections, but there were not severe infections in the side arm. Um, uh, but surprisingly to me, at least, 
uh, there was no uh, substantially higher rate of hemorrhagic cystitis uh, in the side uh, arm, which I was expecting, and we didn't see that. Uh, so the bottom line is that they both appear to be relatively equivalent. Uh, so that, which in my mind, it was in interesting. Again, we saw an improved result on, on, on GBHD outcomes without worsening in, in other outcomes that you normally see when you intensify the immunosuppression. Excellent. So, but still, we have a lot of question and there are some uh, reports and maybe Florent, you would like to comment on this about the cardiac toxicity of both sides. And what is really interesting, and this is why uh, I'm quite happily surprised that you didn't observe this, that the median age of the patient in this paper is 66, which means, uh, you know, at least half of them were considered as elderly for transplant. And usually age in this population comes with a lot of cardiovascular problems and metabolic syndromes. And we know that high doses of both psi uh, can be a risk factor uh, for complications uh, in these patients. And by the way, I noticed recently that you guys at the John Hopkins are running a phase one, two trial, I think, of reducing the dose of both sides. So uh, this is at least from clinicaltrials.gov. I don't know if it's still running or not. Uh, Florent, any comments on this? And because then we have uh, a couple of questions from the audience about whether we are able uh, to reduce the dosage of both sides uh, in some patients who are at high risk of cardiac complications. Yeah, yeah. So, so thank you, Mama. This is indeed a very uh, interesting question. And there is a, a lot of people that are thinking about to reducing the, the dose of PTSI, in particular for patients at high risk of cardiac events. And in the population we described, this is some patient with the median age around 65. So this is all the patients supposed to be at increased risk of cardiac events. And in fact, it doesn't seem that you report an increased incidence of cardiac events. Nevertheless, we have one year follow-up and we can see some long-term follow-up. But we must highlight that in this study, this was only some weak reduced intensity conditioning regimens. And people have a maximum of two, do two days of busulfan, for example. So it was at least some some really reduced intensity and not reduced toxicity conditioning regimen. I, I think this should also be taken into account. Uh, and it may be the explanation why even with the full doses, with 50 milligrams per day, day three, day four of cyclophosphamide, we don't see any cardiac events, maybe because we are really using some reduced intensity conditioning regimens. When we are going to move from ozone platform and we have some more reduced toxicity with higher doses of chemo, this is maybe here that we should discuss in, in patients uh, with some um, uh, history of cardiovascular events and in all our patients to reduce the, the, the dose of fast one cyclophosphamide because we are going to combine two or three high alkylating agents and that can be the, why we have we see all these events after. Excellent. What's your take on this, Javier? So I just, a um, couple of things. Number one, we have published at least two papers specifically looking into older individuals one by Yvette Casamon, another one by Philip Imos, uh, because we at Hopkins do not have age limited for transplant. Now, I'm not particularly proud of that, uh, of that point, but we do not discriminate based on age. So if somebody comes to be transplanted and the patient is 78 and in otherwise good condition and so on and so forth, we will consider that uh, without saying no, just because the age. And and, and I can reassure you, this is definitely our approach. No discrimination on age as long as you are eligible and can tolerate the transplant. Yep. Um, however, that's not necessarily common practice around the globe, though. Um, but we, we have published the outcomes on our older individuals. And in, it is true that cyclophosphamide had uh, the potential for creating cardiac problems. But in 20 so years of, of giving post-transplant sign myself, I am aware of one patient myself in which we run into trouble because of cyclophosphamide. So 
I uh, and we have transplanted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, very likely by now, perhaps a couple thousand uh, using cytoxin. So it's I would say that clinically is perhaps not a very meaningful issue. And going back to the dose reduction, I'm, I, I am uh, aware there are many groups that are considering that perhaps uh, uh, the dose of cyclophosphamide needed is, uh, is uh, perhaps inferior to what we're using, and that may be the case. But just pointing out to the, the paper that we published in 2008, that for sure showed that one day of cyclophosphamide was inferior to two days of post-transplant site. So how much is needed? Heaven knows. I don't know, but we know that giving one dose of cyclophosphamide, the, the, the results are inferior to giving two doses of cyclophosphamide, at least where it comes to chronic GVHD control. Uh, so the truth may be in between, I don't know, uh, but I know of many centers that are trying to use instead of 50, 40 or 35, and, and they're uh, very likely we're gonna start seeing all these data uh, being published in the next uh, few years. So just to be pragmatic before the end, because we have a lot of questions about this, uh, Florent, uh, can you just clarify, for instance, uh, what type of dose reduction you are using or you're proposing? Because I think our group has published already a couple of papers on this. So what we are currently doing in operation, this is a 30% dose reduction because we want uh, significant uh, dose reductions and we apply for that for some older patients above 65 or for patients uh, that have some cardiac comorbidity. But the differences from what has been published is that we are speaking about a patient that receives some APRO transplants. We can't perform TBI as a Baltimore regimen because we don't have access to, to TBI in our center. This is unfortunate. So patients also receive TIOTEPA and busulfan. So they all already received two alkylating agents. And so when we add the pasoflon cyclophosphamide in those older patients, we really want to decrease the doses and in uh, in earn for the patient that have been treated with the platform, we don't see any increase into the incidence of chronic gravis resource disease. So it seems to be as effective for gravis resource disease prophylaxis. And this is great. And it seems that people are doing well regarding cardiac events or infectious complications. So it remains to be confirmed into some randomized study, and we hope we'll be able to run such study, but we have some very promising results. Excellent. So I'd like to share with both of you and with our audience, because we need to be balanced, uh, a comment from a colleague saying regarding age, I agree, but probably no one has canceled comorbidities. Of course, we do agree. And obviously, the comorbidities still have an impact on the final outcome of a transplant. But at the end of the day, I guess it's always about the benefit risk ratio. So if you have comorbidities, you have L, you are an elderly patient, but you have an AML with a complex carrier type, then you have to uh, make a choice. One last uh, question uh, to you, Javier, uh, and this is triggered by a question we had about uh, uh, is the case closed now? And we believe that post psi based prophylaxis is a standard regardless of any type of transplant. And what's next? Did we solve the problem or what kind of improvement, what kind of protocols would you are you designing now or running now for the next step to further improve uh, these results? Or we are already great and everybody's happy. Oh, well, that's the easiest question, right? I guess the answer is no, because we still have people who get bad GBH even under the best of circumstances. It's true that the results with cyclophosphamide are better than with TAC methotrexate, for instance. Uh, and I think we have pr proven that beyond doubt, but I don't think that uh, that we are where we want. We, what we would love to see is a patient who has a transplant with a 100% probability of cure and zero probability of, of GBH, and we're far from that. However, um, I think there are a couple of things that I, that I'm looking um, uh, into the future and in which I'm personally involved. So the, the, the major uh, interest, that, or but this is personal, this is not an institutional thing. My, my major uh, interest right now is in, on mismatch unrelated transplantation. 
uh, we published a paper uh, of a study that uh, we had sponsored by the by the CIBMTR, uh, a prospective study of uh, mismatch on related transplantation using bone marrow. Uh, uh, and in fact, we already published two papers on that study, the original one in JCO, as well as a three uh, year follow up in TCT. And the results of that study, particularly in the reduced intensity arm, are fantastic. And right now we are uh, doing another study, which is very similar, but larger. And instead of using bone marrow, using peripheral blood in patients under, uh, undergoing uh, mismatch on related transplants, which uh, to me uh, uh, will essentially call for universal donors for uh, like literally it will be nearly impossible if these studies uh, pan out to say i don't have a donor for my patient right now the overwhelming majority of people have a donor what i want to be sure is that eventually everybody has a donor and i think that cyclophosphamide is allowing us to get to that point now obviously the studies are ongoing so i may be wrong but i think that that's a major uh, a major step in transplantation because when i was in training and perhaps when the majority of the the, the audience was in training or many of us uh, one of the major things that they were saying uh, when you were reading the book is the hla typing is a major uh, barrier to transplantation and i remember as a fellow talking to patients that could not be transplanted because I never found a donor for them. And those days have to be gone. Uh, and I think that uh, that cyclophosphamide has allowed us to, to get to that point, that's one. And the second thing and last is, I'm sure that there may be ways to improve on, 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 on what we have built so far. Um, perhaps the use of ATG will be one of them. Uh, perhaps the, the incorporation of a batacept, uh, maybe another one, or perhaps something else. But uh, the CIBM, the BMTCTN um, is uh, considering the development of another clinical trial to see if there's a role on, 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 on the use of a batacept in, in patients undergoing transplant. So th this is, a, uh, uh, this is a, a subject that will continue to be researched because as much as we have improved, we have not solved the problem. Well, this is really uh, fantastic. It was a really uh, an amazing uh, journal club. And I do thank you all for the interactivity, for the nice answers you provided and explanations. I do apologize for the colleagues. We could not take all the questions. Also, in general, we don't take personal questions about specific clinical cases. Uh, so, but I'm sure uh, you can write to Florent or Javier if you would like some advice on uh, your uh, cases. Uh, this uh, was the uh, last journal club before the uh, summer break. So we will start again uh, the journal clubs by end of August as usual. However, uh, the IACH activities never stop because uh, we still have our monthly webinars, but also we will have a lot of uh, podcasts uh, during the uh, summer uh, period. Uh, and this is relatively uh, a smart and easy, straightforward way of being always uh, being able to follow uh, the news and the advances. So again, thank you very much, Javier. Thank you, Florent. And uh, thank you for being loyal to the ICH activities. And wherever you are, please enjoy your vacations, enjoy your summertime, enjoy your holidays, and please stay safe and keep well. See you soon.